In the last video, we talked about moment of inertia and the parallel axis theorem. Uh, in this video, we'll just wrap up chapter 9 by just looking at a couple of examples of uh, problems involving uh, moment of inertia. And uh, we'll just briefly talk about the concept of rotational kinetic energy. All right, so let's get started. So um, I would highly recommend working through problem through the prob uh, problem on slide 27. This is a fairly simple problem, but I think it uh, illustrates all the concepts that we have discussed so far um, concerning rotational kinetic and I mean concerning a moment of inertia. So please do this problem. I think I might already have a solution written up. Uh, I'll post that to the Dropbox folder. Uh, okay. This is also a fairly straightforward problem. Um, there's a hint here at the bottom. It's mostly just a plug and jug problem on um, uh, parallel axis theorem. Uh, this problem on slide 29 is on the uh, mastering physics homework. And uh, everybody seems to have trouble with this problem. So uh, I'll, I think it's probably a good idea for me to uh, work through this one. Okay, so in this problem you're given a shape and you have to find its rotational uh, inertia uh, and, and an axis is also specified and you have to find the rotational inertia of this shape about that axis. All right, so let's give it a try, see if we can figure it out and once again um, give it a try yourself and see if you can do it and only then uh, look at the solution after you've really tried it. So, we are, the problem says that there's an equilateral triangle and it's constructed using three identical rods of length L and mass M. So we've got three rods forming an equilateral triangle, right? And the length of, the, length of each rod is L, mass of each rod is M, okay? And you have to find the rotational inertia of this rod about an axis that passes through one vertex. So let's say that this is the vertex about which the axis passes. The axis is a line perpendicular to the triangle. Uh, and you have to find the rotational inertia of this triangle uh, about this axis, right? So let's call this O, this point O. Okay, now how do we do this? Uh, if you look through the table of rotational inertias, there is no triangle. So you don't have this particular shape. So when you don't see a particular shape in your table, you want to, what, what you want to do is you want to see if you can break this into simpler shapes for which you do know the rotational inertias, right? Uh, so how would we break this into simpler shapes? Well, you can just treat this as three rods, right? So here is rod number one, here is rod number two, and this is rod number three. So all three of these rods are rotating about the same axis through O. So you can find their rotational inertia separately and then add them up to get the rotational inertia of the whole system. So that is the whole idea here. So we are going to, whenever you have a complicated shape and you need to find its rotational inertia, all you do is just break it up into, try to break it up into simpler shapes and then find the rotational inertia of each component. Yeah. Okay. So how do we find the rotational inertia of one? So this is simply a rod that's rotating about one end, right? So this is just a rod rotating about one end. And you already know how to find its rotational inertia. It would just be uh, one third ml square. And this is something that we had uh, calculated in the last video. Uh, in fact, uh, in the last video, I'd showed you that uh, the rotational inertia of a rod that's rotating about its center of mass from the table, we know that that's 1 12th ml square. And if you use the parallel axis theorem, you can find the rotational inertia of the rod uh, about an axis that's going through one end. And we saw that that's 1 3rd ml square. All right. So we are done with the rod number one. It's just going to be 1 3rd ml square. What about rod number two? Same thing, just going to be one third ml squared again. What about rod number three? So for rod number three, the situation is like this. 
here is the rod and here is the axis of rotation I'm not drawing the other two rods this is our rod number three it has mass M and length L and it's rotating about the axis which passes through the point O right so this is not an axis which is on the rod at all it's outside the rod uh, so how do we find the rotational inertia of the rod about the axis passing through the point O? Well, you should be, it should be obvious to you by now that we have to use the parallel axis theorem. So we would, here is the center of mass of the rod. And so we know the ICM, which is the I of the rod about an axis passing through its center of mass, right? And we do know the distance uh, to the point O. That is just geometry. So how do we find that? You can find that in a bunch of different ways. Okay, I might as well just draw the other two rods. This length is L, right? This length is L over 2. So if you want, you can just use Pythagoras theorem to find, um, find this. Or probably even easier is to just use the fact that this angle is 30 degrees. So let's call this distance D. D is just uh, L cosine 30 degrees, right? So D is L cosine 30 degrees. So that's L times root 3 divided by 2. Okay, so we know what D is, right? So now we can apply, let's, let's try to apply the parallel axis theorem. So I through the axis passing through O is equal to, this is actually O, not I zero. I through the axis passing through O is equal to I center of mass. I'm just writing down the parallel axis theorem plus a correction, which is the mass of the rod, mass of the object that we are considering uh, times the square of the distance between the two axes, right? So now let's just plug these in. So you know that ICM from the table is 1 12th ml square plus m times uh, the distance between the two axes square. We just calculated that. So L root 3 divided by 2 squared, right? So it would just be 1 12th ml square plus ml square times 3 divided by 4 so let's see so this would be 3 divided by 4 um, so this can be written as 9 over 12 so 10 over 12 ml square which is uh, 5 over 6 ml square is uh, I for rod 3, right? So now all we have to do is just add up the three rotational inertias. So the total I is equal to I for 1, I for 2, and I for 3. So this would be the sum of the first two would be two-thirds ml square plus five-six ml square. I just simplify this and you get the answer. Okay. okay. Um, let's see if I get the correct answer. So if I so this is four over six, so nine uh, four over six. So 9 over 6, yeah. So that, that comes to 3 halves ml square. And that matches with the answer at the bottom of the slide. All right, so hopefully the point of this, uh, uh, the, the main point of this exercise was clear that you just, to find the moment of inertia of uh, a complicated shape, you just find the moment of inertia of its component parts and add them all up. And sometimes you might need to use the parallel axis theorem. All right, now let's talk about rotational kinetic energy okay so actually before I do that let me 
uh, let's look at the analogy that we had that we were considering between rotational quantities and um, angular quantities. I mean rotational quantities and linear quantities. So we had this table. So going back to our analogy, So we remember we had this table so we were writing down the linear variables and the angular variables for different quantities so for position the linear variable was s the angular variable was theta for velocity the linear variable was v, the tangential velocity, the angular velocity uh, variable was omega. For acceleration, the linear variable was the tangential acceleration, the angular variable was uh, alpha. And uh, we can add one more entry to this table. Inertia, in the linear world, inertia is just measured by mass, right? And what is inertia measured by in the angular world? The correct answer is I. So we have one more entry for our table. So we'll keep coming back to this table. Okay, now we can actually make one more immediate addition to this table, just from analogy. We've seen that the angular variables are very, very analogous to the linear variables. So um, in class, I would ask you this question. Suppose I wanna write down a formula for kinetic energy. In the linear variable, uh, in the linear world, that's just going to be half mv square. Right? Can you guess, even if you have no idea what it is, you're learning this for the first time, can you guess what the kinetic energy would be, formula would be in the angular world? I'll let you think about that for a moment. Okay, here is the answer. One half i omega square. You can write that down entirely from analogy. So. So one half mv squared over here, i corresponds to m, omega corresponds to v, and you have the answer for rotational kinetic energy. So if an object is rotating, its rotational kinetic energy is given by one half i omega square. Right. So that's the formula for rotational kinetic energy. Okay, let's look at an application of this formula, the simplest possible application of this formula. So let's consider, so this is slide 31, let's consider the rotational kinetic energy uh, or, or just the kinetic energy of a point mass. Moving in a circle. So we have a point mass which is going in a circle like this and we want to find out it's uh, the radius of the circle is given the, the mass is given in this uh, so we are on slide 31 right now the mass is given the radius is given and omega is given so we know m we know r we know omega right so let's calculate its kinetic energy. So this point mass is going in a circle, right? Uh, for a point mass, you can use either half mv square or you can use half i omega square. It's up to you which one you want to use. And both of these formulas will be the same, right? So for a, so if you use half uh, i, let's try half i omega square, the formula that we just learned. So what is the i for a point mass? I for a point mass is just mr squared as we learned in the previous video. So the ki kinetic energy k 
would just be one half i omega square so one half m r square omega square would be the kinetic energy right okay now let's let's try um, using k is equal to half mv square this will also give us the same answer so let's see if the if it gives us the same answer one half m what's the relationship between v r and omega so v is equal so v is equal to r omega right and so i'm plugging that in so v i use the fact that v equals r omega so that's what i did over here and so i got one half m r square omega square and it gave me the same thing so for a point mass you can use either formula either one half mv square or one half i omega square for a point mass however if it's if an object is not a point mass then uh, you have to, if it's an extended object, then you have to use half i omega square. If it's an extended object rotating around some axis, then you have to use half i omega square. Okay, let's look at an example of a problem. And let's try. So, this is the problem on slide 32. So once again, uh, give this problem, read this problem and give it a try yourself and see if you can figure it out. Okay, so a ring of mass M and radius R is hung from a peg. The ring is then swung to one side by an angle theta and released find its angular velocity when it's back in its equilibrium position so here is the situation you've got a ring which is hung from a peg so this is the initial uh, configuration of the ring let's say that the center of the ring is somewhere over here okay and then you swing the ring to one side so let's draw that with a different color. So the center of the ring might now be over here. Okay. Uh, all right, that's not quite the center of the circle, but that's all right. So the ring is swung to one side and it's, um, uh, it's displaced like that. And then you let the ring go and it just swings back to its original position. Uh, this, the question is, what is its angular velocity when it's back in its equilibrium position? So let's see if we can figure that out. So one approach that you can use is conservation of energy. Uh, that which is k0 plus u0 plus w other equals k final plus u final, right? Now, we are ignoring any friction or air resistance and all that stuff, so we don't have any w other to worry about. What is the initial kinetic energy in the top position? It's starting from rest, so there's no initial kinetic energy. What is the initial potential energy at the top position? Now, here we are going to use a very important fact, which will often be useful um, in uh, coming chapters, which is that if you want to find the potential energy of an extended object, right, you can treat the object as a point mass located at its center, at its center of mass. So, potential energy of an extended object can be found by treating the object as a point mass 
located at its center of mass. Uh, there is a slight qualification to this st statement. It's, it should actually be center of gravity. But as we learn in chapter 11, um, the center of mass and center of gravity are pretty much the same point for most objects. So for, for, let's forget about that minor technicality. So the potential energy of an extended object can be found by just treating the object as a point mass. So that's how we are going to find the potential energy of the ring when it is in the displaced position, right? So we can just tre treat the ring as a point mass located at its center. Right? So we just need to figure out how high is the um, center of the ring. So this angle we are told is theta, right? So we just need to figure out uh, what is the height of theta. So what I'm going to do now is just draw the, I'm not going to draw the ring because it just makes the diagram more complicated. Uh, so the center of the ring was located at position A and then it's displaced to let's say position B and we want to find out what is the difference in height between the two locations of the center of the ring, right? Um, this distance is r, this distance is r, this angle is theta. Remember we had done this calculation on the very very first day of class. So this height h is just going to be r times 1 minus cosine theta. This is just a fact from geometry and uh, if you're having trouble seeing that this is true just look at your notes from the very first day of class. Actually, I might as well just explain this. So this is r and so this distance this much would be r cosine theta and so this much would just be r minus r cosine theta and so that's why h is equal to r times 1 minus cosine theta, right? So if you choose h equals 0 at the height of a then the potential energy of the ring at point B, remember that we are treating the ring as a point mass. The potential energy of, uh, of the ring when it's displaced to point B, uh, when the center is displaced to point B, is just going to be mg. So again, let's just write our formula here. k0 plus u0 plus w other was k plus u. Uh, this was 0, this was 0. So this is mg r 1 minus cosine theta. And that is equal to k final plus u final. Uh, k final we'll have to think about for a moment. u final is just zero, right? So this is just zero. All right. Now think. Of, let's think about what is the final kinetic energy of the ring uh, when it's back to the lower, uh, when its center is back to position A. The ring has rotational kinetic energy, and the formula for that is half i omega square. And that omega is what we are looking for, right? So omega is what we are solving for. So all that we need is i for the ring. Now what should I use for i for a ring? If you look at the table, you'll see that i for a ring, uh, let me just pull up the table. Here it is. So yeah, it looks like we already know what the i is right from the table. It's just uh, half, it's just mr square, right? So it looks like mr square is what we should use. Uh, but there is one catch that you should be careful about. MR, if you use mr square, you'll get the wrong answer. Uh, can you think about the reason why? I'll let you think about it for a moment mr square should not be used for i of the ring. So here's our ring. You should not use mr square. What is the reason for that? The reason is that mr square, if you look in the table, is the rotational inertia of a ring about an axis which is passing through the center, right? This ring is not rotating about an axis passing through its center. It's rotating about an axis which is passing through a point on the rim of the ring, right? So it's rotating about this point about an axis passing through this point. It's not rotating about an axis passing through the center. 
so it's very very important when you're using i to use i about the correct axis so i should be is the rotational inertia of the ring about an axis through the rim of the ring so you should use the correct i um, and let's just go ahead and find that so we need the i about an axis through this point rather than through the center right how do we do that so i uh, we know the i of the ring about an axis passing through the center and we're going to call that icm and so we just simply use the parallel axis theorem so i would be equal to icm plus m d square d is the distance between the two axes in which which in this case is just r right so the i for the ring the correct i to use is m r square this one came from the table plus m uh, r square again because d is also equal to r so it's just 2 m r square that is the correct i to use i hope this point is clear to you um, that's the correct i to use so mgr 1 minus cosine theta is equal to half 2 m r square times omega square and then we just have to solve for omega uh, sorry, uh, I think I uh, I'm using a different M now. Uh, so these capital M's should all be little m. I'm sorry about that. Maybe I should just change. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, both the M's mean the same thing. So I should probably just call this capital M. Capital M is the mass of the ring. Okay. All right. And it cancels out too. So let's solve for omega. Uh, omega is equal to square root of g over r 1 minus cosine theta and that's the answer so c is the correct answer choice all right okay so this is an important so there are two takeaways from this problem uh, takeaway number one is that potential energy of an extended object how did we find that? We treated the object as a point mass located at its center and then just used MGH, right? And the second very important takeaway is that when you're calculating the I, make sure that I is about the correct axis. In the table, the I's are given up for uh, the most convenient axis which is the axis passing through the center of mass that's usually what's given in the table but you want to make sure that you're using the correct i uh, when you're doing a problem all right so we'll stop uh, i think that's the last thing that i wanted to discuss in this particular problem uh, the problem on the last slide the frictionless pulley um, is, is also a very important problem. So make sure you work through that yourself. I've given you a lot of hints on how to do it. So you should be able to do it yourself. All right, so that's all that there is. That concludes our discussion of chapter nine. So I'm stopping the video here.